Thank you for joining us for this morning's pottery demonstration with Dominique and Maxine Toya. My name is Lilia McEnany and I am an assistant curator at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture Laboratory of Anthropology. Those of you who are familiar with MIAC and our programming know that pre-pandemic we regularly hosted our monthly pottery demonstrations in our Buxbaum Gallery. Um, but even though we are now open to the public, we are temporarily con continuing our pottery demonstration series via Zoom. So stay tuned for details on upcoming demos and other programs by following our Facebook page and signing up for our monthly newsletter. Um, before we start chatting with Maxine and Dominique, a few brief things. Um, to begin, I would like to acknowledge the place where this conversation is happening, even though we are in a virtual space and not physically at the museum today, in Ogopoge within the Tewa world. As a non-Native person living in so-called Santa Fe, I am a guest in the ancestral homelands of the Tewa people, and I wish to acknowledge all of the Indigenous communities, Pueblo Navajo Apache, and so many others, past, present, and future, who walk on these lands and steward these places. And I would encourage everybody watching today to reflect on their own positions um, to the lands in which they reside. Um, so I'm just going to briefly introduce our two wonderful um, guests today and then hand it over to them. Dominique Choya is a fifth generation potter from Jemez Pueblo. She started making pieces when she was five years old and has won numerous uh, awards at art shows, including Best of Division for a collaboration with Nancy Youngblood at the Santa Fe Indian Market, Best of Show at the Idle Jorg Indian Market in Indianapolis for a collaboration with Jody Naranjo, Best of Classification at the Herd Indian Market in Phoenix, and Best of Classification at the Santa Fe Indian Market. Her pottery has been published in many books and magazines, and her role models and teachers include her grandmother, the late Mary G. Romero, her mother, Maxine Toya, who is here with us today, and Nancy Youngblood. Dominique has looked up to these women for inspiration for many years, and she lives by what her grandmother taught her at a very early age, quality over quantity. Maxine Toya started making pottery in her 20s. Her clay sculptures are inspirations from her mother, the late Marie G. Romero, and the sculptor, the late Alan Hauser. She loves creating figures that are free flowing and that have a simplicity to them. She has recently started collaborating with her daughter, Dominique, where she utilizes her painting skills. Maxine has won numerous awards for her pottery, including collaborations with her daughter. So with that, I will hand it over to you all. Um, and we can get started. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm glad you're joining us. Thank you so much. And um, it's been a, um, a pleasure and honor to work with Mayak. And I just want to say like, um, thank you again for joining us. My name is Dominic Toya, and I am the fifth generation of potters in my family. And I'm just um, so involved with my pottery and I love my pottery work. I love working on clay. It's like a meditation for me at, at times when I need it in my life. Um, I'm very, um, what's that word I'm thinking of? Um, I just love my pottery. And again, thank you for joining us. And if you have any questions, please um, type them in and they'll be asked and we'll try to answer every um, question that is asked. And I'm gonna turn it over a little to my mother so she can introduce herself. Go ahead, mom. Here? Yeah. Good morning. My name is Maxine Toya, and I'm also a potter, uh, a retired teacher as well. And uh, after my retirement, I really wanted to spend time with Dominique and um, uh, give more exposure to, to her work as well as mine. And so that's what we've been doing the past uh, 10 so years. And as you know, there are many steps involved in the process of uh, pottery making and I'm uh, working with clay and I'm uh, involved with uh, sanding some of my pieces, getting ready for the uh, winter market that's taking place uh, in a week and a half. I'm working on a nativity set and um, as the demonstration goes on, I will be working on these pieces. These two are almost done, so I will be uh, sponging these, but I'm very honored to be here with you this morning and to demonstrate some of the, the steps that we, we use to uh, create our pottery. Have a great morning with us. So, um... 
when we do our demonstrations, we like to talk about our family history, our, our Pueblo life, and our clay is um, dug up here in Hamas, and we have two clay sites. We have the clay sites uh, west of us. We have the clay site, I'm sorry, um, north. north mother. <laughs> There's one to the south. One There's to the one north. in the south and one to the north. Um, so we we get our clay, we, we dry it, and then we re-soak it and um, sift it through a fine sift to get all the impurities out. Then we also collect all our, um, the temper, which is a, a volcanic ash. There's a, a hill up here where we collect that and we sift that um, through a fine sift as well. Once we have cleaned our clay and this, um, our temper, we then mix them um, together and make sure we have the consistency to make a piece. Uh, right now, today, I'm going to uh, make a seed pot. My seed pots are usually my signature when um, I'm at shows. People always ask me about my seed pots, which are the swirls. The reason I started doing swirls was years ago, I saw a P, uh, an ad in a magazine and it was from Gallery 10. And I saw this beautiful swirl piece and I looked at, looked at the name and it was by Nancy Youngblood. And I'm like, oh my God, I wanna do something like that. I didn't wanna follow me. I didn't want to copy her, but I wanted to do something similar. So I started working on pieces and trying to um, find my own um, way of, of doing the swirls. Finally, I decided to do a, a seed pot and that's how I started doing my seed pot, my swirls. Each, people ask me, do you use a fork, a tool? When I do my swirls, I said, no, each line is done individually by lining. I just eyeball it and eyeball it, make sure they're evenly apart. So today I'm gonna to work on one of those. My grandmother and my mother have been great inspirations to me and um, so has Nancy Youngblood. At the time I started making the swirls, I didn't know her at the time, but it was very interesting that we have sat each other, we have sat across each other, right next to each other at the Santa Fe Indian Market for years. And they always got there, they were gone by, we would let them sell it because there was like mobs around her booth, which I, I totally get because their work is amazing. Well, a few years ago, um, after I won um, the best of class at the Santa Fe Indian Market and at the award ceremony, she came up to me and told me it's about time. I almost fell over. I was like, oh my God, my, my inspiration telling me it's about time that I get a prestigious award like that just knocked me over. So I thought to myself, you know, it would be great to collaborate with her. So I sit there for the longest time and finally I went up to her and said, Nancy, thank you for the compliment you gave me on Friday. Would you like to collaborate sometime? And when she said yes, I almost fell over. I, I, I didn't know what to say to her. I'm like, oh my God, so let's talk. Well, it didn't happen until the following year. And we, I really got to know her then. And she's an amazing woman. Um, she became part of our family. Um, I mean, she's just so great to work with. So that's how that relationship started. I have been doing pottery since I was about five, maybe even younger, and um, showing with my mother and my grandmother. We used to do the Eight Northern show, um, then um, the Indian market. So with my adult life and everything, I've done, I've been on the board of the Santa Fe Indian market, Swaya, and that was one of the amazing experiences of my life because um, my mom and I are also very, heavily involved in the LGBT community um, here in Albuquerque or here in New Mexico. And right now, we just had our um, pageant that I own called New Mexico All American Goddess at Large and Gent. Plus, I just turned 50 on um, Saturday, so it was all combined together. We had an amazing weekend. That's why I'm still wearing nails right now. So I usually don't work with nails, but um, they're so pretty, I didn't want to cut them off yet. But um, 
having a voice um, to be part of Swaya as a board member and also representing the LGBT was quite an experience for me. I just got off uh, last or a year and a half ago off the board, but all those six years I will never forget uh, because it was a really true learning experience, experience on how the Santa Fe Indian market is run and how much all that hard work goes into it. So that's why I always encourage, especially artists that do the Santa Fe market to volunteer because you really get a feel for what goes on um, all the work that goes into producing that show. So I always encourage artists, please volunteer, please volunteer. Mom and I volunteer with a lot of other organizations as well. And we try to do our best to donate pieces to organizations we believe in, um, even art shows we donate our, our pieces to. Um, it's just this, growing up in this family has been, I've been so blessed, I've been so, um thankful for all the people that have bought from us our clientele um people that um are always um are following us i've been doing facebook live since the pandemic and that really helped us out so much because i didn't really know where i was going to go because a lot of the galleries that carry my work do all my advertising so when i started doing my facebook lives i was really shocked at the following we were getting and we would do the making and then we would do the firing, um, the lives, and we would sell really quick. And that really touched us as potters and as, you know, just really realized we had that much kind of a following. And throughout the whole pandemic, we did that. And we're very blessed that, you know, people got, um, to see what we were doing um, during the pandemic, um, our creations, and um, it, it, that's how it just started doing more Facebook lives. And other artists asked me, how is it? How are you doing that? So I would teach them or I would um, tutor them and they started doing Facebook lives as well. So I'm very happy that, you know, I'm also teaching other artists about going Facebook live because my grandmother also taught me the, um, that you have to engage your, your, your collectors or you have to teach them how it's done because that will explain why the prices are what they are. It's a hard process, it's a long process. We don't go buy our, our clay, we process our own clay. We don't use the wheel, we use what's called the coil method to where we roll out a piece of clay, um, put, put it on the pot and then we start building it up that way. So it, it's, a, it's a lot of work. Um, so grandma, my grandma loved demonstrating and she loved teaching um, people how each step was done. She's, that was one of my inspirations as far as um, demonstrating. And like I said, we love meeting people. We love talking about our work. We love talking about our family, um, how we've grown and how we've um, done stuff over the years. So that really helped us out this past pandemic and it's been amazing. I'm going to hand it off to mom and let her speak um, for a bit and let her have the spotlight for a bit. So mom, you can turn this around for a bit. Okay. Yeah, it was mentioned to you earlier, uh, my beginnings as a potter. Uh, before I really got into pottery, I used to help my, my family paint their pottery because I had, um, uh, my painting skills were so good that my, my family didn't know about it until uh, uh, later on. But anyway, I was a little girl attending the day school here in Hamas where, uh, where I taught for 35 years. And um, we had, my teachers were the Mama Days. And of course, they were both talented uh, artists as well. Mr. Mama Day taught us painting. And from there, um, I would go home and I would ask my mom, can I help you paint your pottery? Can I do the outlining for you? And she said, no, 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 you're not ready to, to, to do the outlining. Uh, you can fill in uh, the areas that I, I want you to, but not the outlining yet. 
So I would, I could, so I just, I was dying to outline our pottery. I would go to our neighbors and I would ask her, can I outline your pottery? And without hesitating, she said yes. And she used to make these huge pots, wedding vases, and she would put them on my lap and I would start to outline. <laughs> it was just amazing. Then word got out, my family found out, my mom found out how, what, how, what, how talented I was with the outline and how good I was. And so she says, you're not going over there anymore. You're going to help us now. So they, they didn't let me go back to our neighbors anymore. She says, I, need, I was supposed to help my family. And that's what I did for many years. I helped mom and I helped my grandpa with his gourds. I painted those. I love to paint. And so later on, I, I would uh, visit mom and we would work together and she would be work, making something. And one day um, on a Sunday, I remember very, very clearly, I went and she was working on an owl. And um, she said, um, I said, let me have some clay, mom. I'm going to try and make an owl while I'm watching you. And so she, she gave me a little bit of clay and first couple of attempts didn't work good. I got frustrated. And that was my problem. I would give up right away. But that day, I just, I, I'm going to make something that looks like an owl. So I was determined. And lo and behold, I made a little, little owl. And that was the beginning of my, my clay uh, adventure, my journey, working with Mother Earth and Clay Woman. And it has been the most, uh, most satisfying uh, experience and um, and learning what it really means to be a potter and the work that is involved and the appreciation that I have for all my my um, mentors my my mother my grandma my grandparents my make my great grandpa all the things that they were involved in it, it was it, it, I grew up in a very artistic family. I was very fortunate. They nurtured me in the area of art and it just, it, I just blossomed. I just grew. And so I won numerous awards, even in school, when I was still in elementary school, I won awards at the state fair. And then when I got into pottery, my pottery experience, um, I, I was so in love with, with the, the clay sculptures that my mom was doing. And, and I went to, I attended the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe and went to school where these great people, uh, teachers, artists were teaching Alan Hauser, Rich Shoulder, um, Loy Kiva New, um, Partington, Ralph Partington, the Lolamas. Oh my God, they were all there. And the students, uh, Kevin Red Star, uh, TC Cannon. I mean, you those guys were amazing. And painters, they were painters. But it's just amazing how how that experience and it has come full circle for me now because um, I, I I'm I'm still enjoying what I'm doing and hopefully. I can go on and have that steady hand that I have with my painting. And in a, in a little bit before the session is over, I'd like to show you uh, a few of the, the completed pieces that I have. But the journey is wonderful and I enjoy work, working with, with Dominique. And we spent a lot of time together and uh, sometimes we, we will we'll have squabble a little bit with <laughs> But every now and then, most of the time, it's good, and we have fun. So here's Dominique again. <laughs> she just had to bring that up. It's interesting um, that she brings that up, because every time we do uh, a demonstration, um, the way we start demonstrations is I'll be mixing clay, and she always tells me, do not get it too wet, and she'll say our language. So everybody doesn't know what, what she's saying. And I'm kind of, we're kind of like bitter, um, bittering, and I'm like, Mom, I know, I know. And what happens? It always gets a little wet. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then people be laughing. We'll tell them what's going on, and we'll start laughing. And a lot of people tell us, "Oh, you'll make a great comedy team. You should do a skit." Well, uh, I don't know if that's going to happen, but 
And so mom has been talking about her, her experience. And I told you a little about our experience or my experience. And it's been a great journey, you know, like I said, passionate. That's the word I was thinking of earlier, passionate. I have so much passion for pottery that I remember growing up and, and my mom talked about awards and I always wanted to um, get one of those big high awards like best of uh, pottery or best in classification, best of show. And I worked and worked and worked till that happened. And when that happens, that feeling is just amazing because you're 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 seen or you're you're respected by your your fellow artists, judges, collectors. That just opens more doors for you. And I think growing up too, like mom said, growing up in an artistic family, you you're you're already being um, nurtured um, for your life in art. So that that was my nurturing growing up with all of them. You know, even my aunt Laura, my grandmother, and they used, used to all work together. And at one point, they used to share a booth together. Mm -hmm. And that was hard because they were all in one booth. I remember it was right across. It was Woolworth then in Santa Fe. That's where my grandmother had her booth, right in the corner of San Francisco and Lincoln, um, and right across Woolworth. And it was an amazing experience. It was so much fun. Oh my God. Then my mom was asked by Santa Fe Indian Market if she wanted her own booth. And that's when we first moved to the, our, our, our present place. But um, we do a lot of these um, demonstrations or webinars, and we even are asked once a year to go out to um, to Boston, to um, the Phil or in Andover Phillips Academy, and we teach a pottery class for a whole week there, and we have um, seminar or talks there at the Peabody Museum of Anthropology. And then at the Phillips Academy, which is across the street, we have the pottery class um, that whole week. And there, oh my God, there's students from all across the world. It is so much fun working with them throughout the whole week. And our last day there, we fire their pieces and they are so in love. These experiences have been amazing to us. Um, just working with other artists, um, native or non, and we usually have a, a, a class, or not class, um, well, yeah, a class out here once a year. And right now we're still on lockdown. So hopefully once we're off of lockdown, um, we will resume that class. And what it consists of is you get here in the morning and then we'll talk about our family history. We'll mix the clay. I'll give you some clay. We work on clay till noon. And then we have a Hamas feast with oven bread, Hamas enchiladas, red, red chili. And then at one o'clock, we'll resume and we have medallions made for you already. So we'll sand those and then mom will take over and teach you how to paint. About two o'clock, I'll start loading the box that we fire in outside and we'll fire your medallions and you'll go home with your medallions. I'll fire a few pieces, but you know, I, we love educating people. That's our main thing. Mom was an educator, she retired. So I think that that part, that part of me comes from them, my grandmother and her about the educating. And like uh, we've worked with many galleries. We've been fortunate to work with galleries and it's just been an amazing experience. And when, when we're asked to do this, we were more than happy to because like we said, we just love talking about our pottery, our, our family history. Um, it, it's, it's one of those feelings that it, it's hard to explain sometimes, but the best word I can use is passion. It's, 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 I love it. So maybe we can like read questions now. Does anybody have any questions that we can answer at this time? I don't have any questions coming in from the chat yet, so I would encourage everybody to go ahead and um, don't be shy. Um, but I would love to ask um, selfishly one of my own questions. Um, I would love to hear about the first piece that you two did together. Um, I have just so enjoyed hearing about this incredible 
nurturing community that you are both a part of. And um, it would just be fun to hear about the first piece. The first piece we did together was uh, for the, the Herd Indian Market. And this was not our normal piece that we do. I've always wanted to collaborate with mom. And I've always loved her, her, her clay, her faces. They're so beautiful. So one year I made a, a water jar and I swirled the whole thing, but I left five circles to where I wanted her to um, build into it or form a face with a necklace. And what all those five ladies represented was my great, great grandmother, Benina, who was from Zia, uh, my great grandmother, my great, great, my great grandmother for singular, my grandmother Marie, my mom and myself. So we call it that five generations. And that was our very first piece that we collaborated on. We did one more after that, something similar. And just in the few years, like about four or five years ago, I told my mom or I asked my mom, you know what, I've been, I wanna collaborate with, with you, but I just snapped. You know what we can do? I can make the pot because we're also from um, uh, part Zia and the Zia, we love the Zia pots. So I told her, okay, you know what? I'll, I'll form a, a storage jar and you paint around it. Remember what grandma made? We, we, uh... um, we saw one of my grandmother's piece and that's what we uh, replicated. And um, I polished the top and the bottom and that's how our collaboration started, the pots. And then like a couple years later, I was looking at a piece and I said, you know what, mom? I'm gonna mica the top and mica the bottom. She wasn't too was fond, to fond of the idea at the time. Cause she was like, no, just polish the top and the bottom. It's more traditional. And I said, but mom, you know, I'm contemporary. So let's try this and see how it goes. After that, she was hooked. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how our collaboration started. <laughs> that is a great story. Thank you for sharing. Um, we have a question from Mary asking if you can just describe a little bit about what you're doing to the piece you're working on right now. Dominique. Right now, um, I am. I was building the piece when mom was talking and I've gotten it this high. So what I'm gonna start doing is I'm gonna start using my knife and start um, forming it more to make it more circular. I had my finger inside of this, um, smoothing it out. My grandmother always taught me that even if it's gonna be a seed pot, make sure the inside is as smooth as the outside. So that was, that's one of my things now that I have to have it smooth down the inside before I, I um, close it on the top. So that's, that's what I'm doing. But with my knife, I will be forming it more and making it more round and circular so that this, was, this is going to be a seed pot that swirled all the way around. So once I close the top, I'll let it sit on the side for a while. And before we finish, I'll kind of give you a demo on how I eyeball each piece. So I'll, I'll have this sitting aside for a bit. Great. I think we would all love to see more about um, how the swirls come to be. Um, <laughs> it's always very mysterious. I, yeah. Well, everybody always asks me, it's like, how do you do that? How do you get them so perfect? And I just tell I don't have a tool. It's just all by eyeballing. And over the years, I've learned how to perfect my, my methods. Years ago, oh God, it would, no, I, I, like Nancy has taught me too as well. It's like you, you have to perfect your, your techniques and your methods. And she always tells me practice makes perfect, practice makes perfect. So that sticks in my head too. So I've had a lot of great teachers over the years. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and speaking of teaching, we have a question from Maria asking how um, we can be informed when you start doing your in-person workshops again. Um, like I said, right now, it's, it's our tribe has decided to remain on lockdown. We do have a curfew, but we can't get out every day, but we can't have outside people coming in. 
So um, they've set dates before and then they've uh, rethought their their stand on when our tribe will be open. So that's really hard to say. Um, you, I have a Facebook page, um, Dominic Toy Creations, and usually I put all my pottery stuff on there. So if I'm, when we're gonna start the, the, classes. the classes, I'll probably put it up there on my Facebook, on my um, Dominic Toy Creations Facebook page so that we can let people know when they will resume. Yeah, the classes usually uh, happen after the Labor Day weekend in September while the weather is still nice because we do our class out, out in the back uh, porch. And it's a wonderful uh, day to have people come up and we have like 20 people yeah. that are limit. Um, but also it, you will, um, Lynch Box will also uh, put out information on his on his web page. Oh, we 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 um we get together and get together for us. Right. Yeah. Um, I wanted to show you while I have you. I'm working on the little donkey now. But what I do next after I have sanded, I have uh, <laughs> used a uh, fine sandpaper to really smooth it out. If you, you can see how how smooth uh, the surface is now. I try to take off all the, the dust from it. And the next step is taking my sponge and using a wet sponge to take the rest of the dust off and get it even smoother. So it's re-wetting it again, but do it fast. My sister Laura is the one that uh, started doing this years and years ago. And then the areas that are hard to get into with a sponge, I use a brush. Brushes are great. And the tools, you, you, there's so many tools. I use toothpicks uh, when I'm making. So this is how I use my brush to get into those areas that I can't get into with this with a sponge. After these are completely dry, when I'm done with all the sanding, the next step would be polishing. Explain to them what polishing means. Polishing is applying a uh, clay slip. Well, this piece will have a uh, red clay slip and uh, white uh, clay slip on it. I, Polish, I, I apply red uh, clay, red uh, clay slip on this air on these areas here the robe. The, to, to show uh, that it's the robe. And then I take a stone, I don't have it close to me. Then I start while the while the, the clay slip is moist, I start polishing with a stone as fast as I can while the clay slip is moist. Once it dries, it's really hard to, to keep polishing. So you have to be very, very fast. And then after you do that, then this little strip here is gonna be white and around here. So then I, these areas are next and I apply the, the gray, gray clay slip and, it, and polish that. And during firing, that, that uh, color will turn uh, beige. So it changes the color. What is it I can use? Okay, I can use my fingers to make it even smoother. So now that, okay, now it's perfectly round and circular. What I'm gonna do, I usually stand up and that's exactly what I'm gonna do. I'll use a tool and a sharp tool and I'll look, I'll look, I'll stand up and I'm gonna look at from the top and make sure it's circling, it's even. It's that it's, the, my hole is right in the middle. So once I know that it's right in the middle, I kind of make my hole a little bit bigger. And what I'll do is I'll let it set aside for a few minutes 
since we still have time, I'm gonna let this set, a, set aside for a few minutes, then I'm gonna show you how I swirl each piece or each rib. And like I said, it's all by eyeballing. And that's what really amazes people. And I just love doing swirl seat pots. Those, these are one of my favorites. And like I said, when people see me, see one of these, they know it's a Dominique Toya piece. And I'm gonna let that set aside. Now I'm just gonna work on a, 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 a miniature since I have a little bit of clay left. But if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. We have some questions about the process of harvesting clay and what you look for. Um, when we harvest our clay, um, like I said, we have two clay sites. And one is more gray that has more roots in it. And one is on top of a hill that's the one that we're using right now. The red clay. The red clay. Um, it's interesting how they come out the same in the firing, but it's just that the gray clay is more, it's, it has more roots in it and it's harder to clean. So when we harvest our clay, they look like chocolate. Um, when we get it with our sledges, it looks like bits of chocolate. And you try and find the darkest one because those, that's, a, the, that's the best um, clay that there is because it's just dark and it's smooth. Um, that's the part that hardly is, uh, has um, particles in it. So, but then we let it completely dry. We lay it out after, oh, the other thing, when it comes to clay, we always say a prayer um, to mother earth um, with our cornmeal and thank, thank her. And um, are taught just to collect enough for what we need. And we're taught, you know, she's always gonna be there. There's always gonna be, uh, a supply, do not go overboard. So we just collect enough for the year and then um, we let it completely dry at home. We usually have it in the back porch, we completely dry it. Then we re-soak it. A lot of people don't do this, but we've, we've um, found this to be um, what, why we re-soak it and we clean it um, wet. It takes out more impurities and it becomes more cleaner. And we like our clay to be very clean and we're very picky <laughs> at how clean our clay is. So that's how we process our clay. And like I had said earlier, um, after we cleaned our clay, we usually go get our, our, our temper and the volcanic ash. And we have a site here on, the, on our Pueblo or Trice, um, the west side of the Pueblo. And it's like baby powder, it's like talcum. Um, we also clean that um, through a sieve, and then once both are cleaned, we start mixing it together. So that's how that process is done. That's great. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, uh -huh. So you only you collect just once a year for the whole year, right? Yeah. That's just an incredible amount of work. I can't even imagine doing all of that for so <laughs> new both produce an incredible amount of work, especially around markets and things like that. I can't mm -hmm. imagine the quantity and hard work and manual labor that it takes to put all of that together. It is, it's like, it's, you're literally spending the whole day up there, you know, collecting enough clay for, because sometimes, you know, it's exhausting just trying to pick it out of there. You know, it's, it's a lot of work. And these days we just, we just have mom sitting on the side, she'll be picking the ones on the side and, but we, my sister and I usually go dig for the, the, the chunks where um, the clay is at. And our tribe is very good about cleaning the area because there's been times it's, a, it's like a cave and that's scary because the top could easily fall on you while trying to get the clay out. But for the past few years, they've been very good at taking the top part off and clearing that area. So we're thankful for the tribe for doing that. Absolutely. See, now I'm going to, I just get a piece of, uh, a, a, a piece of clay and I make it into a ball. And this is what they call a pinch pot. And then you put a hole in the, uh, the piece in the ball and you start forming against your, your palm and with your finger, you're pushing down inside. So that's how you make the pinch pot. Now, 
instead of adding more clay to it, what I'm doing is I'm, I am bringing up the clay from the middle part and start forming my little bowl and I'll keep forming it. And that, that's how you make a little pinch pot. That's what they call pinch pots. I don't know exactly what this is going to come out to. Oh, the other thing too that uh, we've learned, and, and it's so true working with Mother Earth and our, our clay mother. There are times where you picture what you want to make. And it's so interesting how it won't come out. And my grandmother taught me, you know, she's going to be what she wants to be. You can't force her to be something that she doesn't want to be. So I learned that early on as well. Um, our, and we always say our clay is alive. She's alive. Our clay mother is alive. And that's what we also pray to. We ask her for guidance, to have a beautiful peace, to have a good firing. So there's a lot of spirituality involved in our processes or in our clay. And we learned early on. And my grandmother, another thing that she taught me was, I, um, I remember mom just talked about it earlier, patience. There's been times when I was a teenager that I was so frustrated with a piece not coming out that I just wanted to, to throw it. And my grandmother taught me, do not ever do that to a piece. You're disrespecting Mother Earth, Clay Mother. And that's, I learned very early on, you have to have patience. You can't be doing stuff like that. So it's a lot of respect as well. Uh, we respect her. We believe she's alive. She guides us. Um, it's just amazing how spiritual our our clay work is. When I'm okay. Yeah, I uh, sponged uh, two pieces. You can see they're drying right now. And here's Joseph. And I'm working on the donkey. And this is going to be a four piece nativity set. Then I wanted to show you the finished pieces that I've been working on. Been working on some angels. And this is the red slip that I was talking about earlier. And this is stone polished. You can see the gloss. And then I did a little painting on the robe. And the wings are also painted. And this is all freehand. I don't do any kind of uh, line work with a pencil. I go right into it with a brush. And um, this is the other thing my, my sister taught me to do too, Laura. She started doing that. And here's another angel. This is a mica finished one, a little bit bigger than the other one. More line work on the wings and the, the back. Again, very simple. The form is very simple and elegant. And the last one is my town crier. More line work. This one is a, has a relief kiva. And I just started doing this. I started doing the relief uh, Pueblo as well. This idea. <laughs> huh? This idea. Oh, Dominique's idea. <laughs> And she does, she does give me ideas and I, I work and then I say, yeah, huh, I could do that. So, and here's uh, our cornstalk design. Our family is corn oh, clan, right. uh, Zia corn clan. And we, that's our signature on the bottom. And we use the corn uh, signature. Uh, we're Zia corn clan and more polishing on, on the piece. And this is the beige I was telling you about. This is a gray slip that I use. And then during firing, it turns this color. So these I'm getting ready for the winter market uh, in a week and a half. You came about ready. And then do me a favor. Okay. Can you get, go get my pieces of three, the two miniatures yeah. and the other one? Mm -hmm. um, like you can show them my pieces that are done. I have three pieces that are done as well. And I'm gonna have mom uh, go get them. I don't want to get them. I got, I'm full of clay. And I wanted to touch on that about um, clans. We're all born into clans. And like my mom said, ours is the um, Zia corn clan. My great, great grandmother, Benina was from Zia. So she had five daughters and um, she married a Hamas man. They have five daughters. 
So all her daughters are part of the Zia Corn Clan. And you always go by your mother's um, clan. Um, that's how um, I think all the Pueblos do it. It's different for different tribes or nations, how the clans work, but for, for the Pueblos, um, it's done by um, your mother's side. So you go through your mom. Mom, um, can you, mom, put them where you're sitting at. So when you turn it that way, you can. No, let me. Okay. So you can show, because I can't show them. I got clay on my hands. I don't want to get anything on them. So clans, that's how, um, um, that's how we know what clan we're from, our mother's side. So we're from the Zia corn clan. And we always um, use the corn stalk and um, especially on the bottom. So the way I do my signature, I'll put Dominique Toya and then the corn stalk. That's my um, signature. So now I'm going to see, I have, um, okay. I'm gonna have mom show you my piece that we're finished. I wish you would have showed the other, not the, the black one, but the, is that one sold? Well. These are, flip it over. You, you, okay, mom, look at yourself. This is not signed yet. I know. Oh. No, my other side, mom. Flip it the other side. Mom, like this. This or like this? Thank you. Oh. Look, you can see yourself. Oh. <laughs> she's, she's new to this, so you got to yeah. be, I'm trying to be patient with her. So this is one of my larger pieces. And then turn it around. That one's all polished except for the one line of the my, my Keisha slip I do. This is where it starts. And goes all the way around goes all the way around and goes all the way down to the bottom all the way down to the bottom there you go put that aside show that yeah. face she's going to be my banna for now <laughs> and this one's it's a miniature polished. also on polish this is a miniature and it's got the black mica the swirls and then this one the black mica this is my seed pot my miniature that this one sold already so and you can see the signature on the bottom so those are my pieces that are already done um what i'm gonna start doing is early i showed you so here's here's where the hole is at what i do with my tool with this is okay i'm gonna i think i'm gonna hold on let's see because I really want you to see how it's done. So what I do, usually I, I line it up. I make eight lines and that's where I start my swirling from. And as I take the line a little at a time, I'm going to show you how I'm okay as you see me right now I'm just eyeballing and trying to bring down the line a little at a time and I'm going to show you here in a bit once I do the top part and I do it portions at a time I don't do the whole pot once one in one setting I do it portions to make sure all the lines are even And this is how my seat pots are, are done or are created. I'm gonna bring the pot to you now. And show you how far I've gotten so far. <laughs> See now that the top part is swirled. Now they're all swirled. Now what I'm gonna start doing is start bringing the lines further down. And that's really gonna start showing the, the swirls and start showing you how evenly apart they are. Years ago, this would take me hours to do on one piece but like i told you i perfected this so much to where 
my eyeballing is so good that I know exactly what I'm doing. I know exactly how to swirl it. I know exactly how to turn it around. So a piece like this will probably take me anywhere from, depending on the size, like this size, it should take me about, I'm um, thinking 20 minutes the most. And we don't have 20 minutes, so I'm gonna start showing you how it's coming around just so I can, just so you can see what I'm talking about. See how the lines are, are, are um, getting further and further and going, um, going around and around. Each line will be going all the way around till we hit the bottom. So, um, well, I do this. Is, are there any more questions so far? Yes. Um, while you are working on that piece, um, we have a question about seed pots. Um, uh -huh. And I think the question is if they are for storing seeds. Um, and it, Mary, the um, it's seed pot, P-O-T, not P-O-D. So it's not the shape of a pod. It's just the descriptive word for the shape right. of pot. So yeah. seed pots were um, formed, um, well, from, from my understanding back in um, the Anasazi days. So what they would do is there were also farmers at that time. So they would store their seeds. What they would do is they would put the seeds inside after they harvested and for next for the following year's crops so when spring came along um oh the reason why they put them in these pots so the my or the my um the rats mouse all that wouldn't get into um the storage storage area where they had the seeds so they would have a, a area where they had these big or huge pots full of seeds so when spring came around they would break the pot get the seeds out so they were more <laughs> They were actually used. <laughs> now they're decorative. <laughs> you cannot smash your um, seed pots. <laughs> well, like I, like I tell people, you know what? Um, you bought it. Um, <laughs> if you want to go, um, do that? I can't tell you not to. <laughs> that piece um, that Maxine showed of yours with the... Um, with the black micacea swirls was spectacular. That was oh, a really beautiful piece. I don't have much of that black micacea slip anymore. So I'm like really trying to do less with that. So I can like, <laughs> until I get some more. Definitely. We also have a question for um, Maxine that came in um, about that town crier piece in particular. Uh -huh. Um, we have a question from Rob asking just about the backstory of the town crier, um, if you are able to talk about that. Okay, the town crier, all my pieces uh, that I do, uh, I, I want them to tell a story. The town crier, for instance, uh, is a very uh, special uh, figure that represents uh, a, a person, a man in our community who is uh, given that responsibility. In the summertime, the town crier will uh, go around the village and saying a prayer when the, uh, our different societies, we have six societies that go fasting. And during the four days that they're fasting, every evening, the town crier would go around to, to say a prayer um, uh, uh, in a village and then mostly in the, in the uh, plaza area but i always want my my pieces to represent someone in our community and what they stand for and like i do the mother and child of course mother being a mother is a very important responsibility and and job and so i i like to create different uh different uh versions of, uh, of mother and also i do a a corn maiden Corn is also a very important uh, staple in our community, and that's we plant corn every year. And we use corn in various ways. Of corn, corn meal we use for praying, corn we use for cooking, and our um, clan. And corn we our use. Clan. And corn is our clan, and corn we use for naming a baby when it's born, when it's born. 
So we, various things like that, I, I use those, those titles or those images and try to create a clay sculpture um, and to give them honor and to, uh, to help me in my, my growing up, in my, in my journey as a person, as a mother, as a woman, uh, and also giving that, that honor as well as to our men folk who have also many responsibilities in our community. So they, they mean a lot to me. They, they, I was even thinking about uh, my mom as we were talking, she gave me a lot of ideas to do with clay, uh, clay sculptures. She used to make this grinding ceremony and I wanted to in her honor, give her that honor and, and help people to remember what kind of pottery she used to make. So I made a, uh, I've made several corn, corn uh, grinding ceremonies. They're very special. They're very just, just wonderful. And another thing- And you, but you, you collaborate with Nancy Youngblood. And then I collaborated with young, Nancy Youngblood as Tell well. What you did. She wanted uh, to honor her grandmother, uh, uh, what was her what, where, Margaret Margaret Tafoya, and she gave me this picture. She had this uh, postcard or picture of her grandmother with all these huge pots around her, and per, those pots that she had made, and she wanted to to replicate that that image. So I did Margaret. I made Margaret, and she did all the miniature little pots that Margaret made. And we entered that at the Herd uh, Museum show, and we played second and sold it. And that was that was a, a, a wonderful honor to to do with Nancy. So it's just those kinds of things that that I, I I'm always trying to capture something, some some kind of action or figure in our community. And I still have ideas that are evolving, and I really am ready to move on to newer ideas and new forms. So hopefully that will be happening soon. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, that's wonderfully inspiring. Um, and I, and I've always, I've always told her that I think um, her work will be great as um, bronzes, you know, mm -hmm. because they're so flowing. There's, I talk about, so I think we need to start that getting you one. into bronze and it will be amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. That would be incredible. So I finished this swirl pot while you were talking. See, it's I'm fast now. <laughs> so I'll let this set and go deeper into the pot later on. Fantastic. Wow. I went by fast. Yeah. Um, so we are just about out of time. So that timing worked out perfectly, Dominique. <laughs> um, you're a pro. Um, is there anything else that, oh, we have one last question um, that I think will help us wrap up, which is where um, folks can purchase your work for both of you. Um, you sh like I said, um, probably the best way to get a hold of us, um, I'll give you my personal information, mm -hmm. uh, my phone number, but the best will be on Messenger um, for Dominique Toya, Dominique Toya Creations or Maxine Toya. And these pieces that we showed you are, are for sale now. They're so the ones that we just showed you, the ones are for sale. So, yeah. and it has all our information on there too, on our Facebook page, our phone number, all that as well. So and thank you for having us. Yes, thank, thank you, you so much. much for having us. It was an amazing experience. Thank you everybody that joined in. Yeah, so thank you, Dominique and Maxine. And thank you everybody um, and have a great rest of your day.